Welcome to Infuse Live and the countdown to the 2006 Biola Media Conference. I'm your host, Leo Partible, and with me is director, Darren Grant. Darren, great to have you here. Nice to be here. Of course. Now, before we get, get to the question about um, Diary of a Mad Black Woman, I just mm -hmm. want to ask, a, give me a little bit about your background as a music director. You've, you've directed um, videos by, by Jewel, uh, Standing Still, mm -hmm. uh, Destiny's Child, Survivor, of course, and most recently, Kirk Franklin. Mm -hmm. um, that journey probably started about 12 years ago. Actually, before that. When I was younger, I was a break dancer, and I loved hip-hop music, and my mom's always been in the indie film world back in Seattle. And um, she actually went on to get her master's in film and taught at San Diego State, and she taught one other place. And I never really know, knew what I wanted to do, and, but I always had kind of a passion for photography and short little home, you know, home films, and, uh, but I loved music. And so as I got to college and I went through a couple of different majors, I said, how can I, you know, put these two together? How can I do what I love and be good at it and not spend my time in college, you know, to come out and do something completely different? So. I switched my major a couple times and ended up in film and said, you know what, I want to be a music video director. And that was my immediate goal. And I like films, but honestly, at film school, I slept through all my film theory classes or I was up in the back, you know, not sleeping, but definitely not paying attention. And now I'm actually paying for it because I really do like movies and I've been directing actors and I've had to go back and, you know, catch up. But as soon as I got out, as soon as I got into San Diego State, I basically moved to LA and started working as a PA, a delivery driver, was a propaganda films at the time, which was like kind of the, the big major, uh, the biggest actually commercial and music video house, production house in the world at the time. They had, um, they have Antoine Fuqua was there, Michael Bay, David Fincher, Spike Jones. Um, who else came out of there? Um, probably uh, Dominic Sinna came out of there. Mark Romanek came out of there. I mean, that's not that many prolific people to come out of one company is unheard of. So that's where I kind of trained for a couple of years. And then finally, I was just uh, shooting small things on the side and I just kept bugging directors on the set. It was like, look at my stuff. I shot this spec commercial or I shot. You know, this little thing with some girl doing some kind of crazy dance move or this model holding a bottle of CK1. You know, just a lot of little weird spec things that showed that, hey, I, I have an eye and this is kind of what I want to go into. And didn't really shoot music videos. And then finally I was on a music video and I just told this guy, look at my tape. I always carried a VHS tape in my back pocket. And I was an electrician. I went from PA. I did sound, craft service, everything. But then I was a lighting technician for probably about three years because I was really into the photographic and the lighting side of it. And finally a guy looked at my tape and called me back and he said, you know what? He's like, there's something here and I, I have a job that I can hook you up with. So my first job was this guy named Hammy on Capitol Records about 10 years ago. And then after that, it just kind of like went off. We did about 10 videos the first year, about 25 the second year, 25 the third year. Now, now I remember the you, fourth, something like that. you did a, actually, it was a Jordan Knight's I Can Never Take the Place of Your Man, right? Yeah, I did that a couple was Jordan Knight. Yeah, so, so I think that was the first time I actually heard of your, heard your name and that's read your name on. That's about, read your name on. That was about halfway in. Was that halfway yeah. in? Yeah, at that point I'd already, you know, I broke Destiny's Child. That was the first female group I worked with, and I did uh song they had called No 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 with Wyclef. That was like their big hit when they came out when Beyonce was 15. And then I did about seven more with them. And the biggest one was Survivor. So. Wow, wow that's great. So how did you come to be involved with um, Diary of a Mad Black Woman? I mean, did you, were you, were, did you know about the project or did you hear about it? Were, were you exposed to it actually in church? Uh, no, that's another long-winded story. So. <laughs> You got time. <laughs> I gave you the short version. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, basically, after you know, a hundred and some videos, and just kind of always being a storyteller, you know, I had a narrative element in my videos, and I never, you know, I probably didn't get as many like of a real hot, like the cars and the women, and 
I got some of those, but not a lot of those because I always try to put a little extra spin on it or make it a little more sophisticated. And they just couldn't appreciate it. But um, when I did get an agent, they started blasting my reel around town. They said, wow, this is one of the best narrative music video reels we've ever seen because everything was a story, 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 story. And there's a couple fun things in there, but I really just I started getting into the stories. It's heavy. And... Um, the agent that I ended up going with, he used to be, he called me the first time and he was in the mail room and I was like, man, I ain't messing with you, you know, and then he, he was scooping up people at William Morris and then he called me back four years later. He's like, are you going to mess with me now? He's like, I have Tim Story. He just opened a barbershop. I have, you know, Andre 3000, you know, Outcast and Big Boy. I have, and he started rattling off all these people. I said, okay, well, you know, considering Tim, Tim's doing, you know, $108 million Fantastic Four, that last one he did which at the time was the biggest budget a black director has ever got for a film. I said, you know, okay, I guess you've arrived. You know, this is the guy who was in the mailroom when he first called me. So we hooked up, and um, he had another client called Tyler Perry. And I didn't even know who Tyler Perry was. I was exposed to him through my dad, who lives in North Carolina, because Tyler's really big down there in the south. And, uh, you know, they called it the Chitlin Circuit, but it's, he's obviously expanded his horizons past that. And, uh, you know, my dad would be watching these things. It would be a holiday, and there would be this, like, six-foot-four guy in a dress and a wig. I'm just like, what is this? Turn this stuff off. You know, he's like, no, you got to watch the next one. I'm like, no, I don't. Two hours back-to-back. -back. But, you know, I finally focused up, and I watched. I was like, okay, they're bootlegs, but they're decent. You know, one angle, like. Wait a second. These are bootlegs that you. Yeah, my dad had bootlegs. <laughs> of the play. You know what I mean? Bootleg play tapes because he hadn't done a movie yet. And, uh, and then my wife kept saying, Tyler Perry's coming to town, we gotta go. Then my agent saying, do you know Medea? Or it was the other way around. I was like, I didn't know the two were the same guy. My wife saying, let's go see Medea. And my agent saying, Tyler Perry, do you know him? And I'm like, no, I don't know. You know, I'm doing all these other things, I don't know. And so the day of the thing, so my agent's like, I got you tickets. And then my wife's like, I got tickets a month ago, we gotta go. So the day that Tyler Perry finally got here, um, yeah, we had, we had tickets and, uh, we had, well, had two sets and my wives were like way up there and then the agents were like front row at Kodak and I went and I saw them. I was like, okay, let me look at that script again. And I looked at diary and I did my homework and I started hearing this stuff like Tyler has sold out the Kodak faster than any act ever has. Tyler was homeless eight years ago. Now he's worth a hundred million dollars and all these crazy facts and so i said you know this guy's making dough you know he is making a ton of money okay you know what the movie is probably gonna make money i said but the material i don't know about this guy and the dress but after i read that script a couple times it's so like there's so much weight and so much heart in the in the project i finally was just like you know what let's let's do it and so, and so, so this was something that touched you spiritually yeah, absolutely. With more faith-based. Yeah. And it didn't hit you over the head, but, you know, those themes are obviously in there. And, um, yeah, I was definitely moved by the story, and it's just basically in there. And, um, yeah, I was definitely moved.